I promised my team and I promised you on Sunday that all of us are going to stay in this Wednesday the 20th, the inauguration day, because of all of the things that's happening in the country. And I think it's only wise that we should stay out of sight as much as possible. We don't have a dog in this fight, and so we don't need to be out doing much of anything to aggravate anybody, to hurt us, harm us in any way. And the color of your skin is a license to some people who are upset about the way things have gone. So today, we're going to do a message called the Quantum Leap, and we're going to enjoy that in the safety of our homes. God bless you. I love you. Enjoy the word of God. Stay safe. We have been dealing, uh, I, I would say, uh, extensively with the whole concept of, of what I call, and we will call this series, The Quantum Leap. And that is having the capacity to jump from uh, where you are and the conditioning that you have experienced to where Jesus wants you psychologically and mentally. The whole concept surrounds transformation, not confirmation. And the edict that we should not be conformed to this world, but transformed by the renewing of the mind. And obviously, we are sitting in here tonight having uh, spent our time dressing and putting uh, gas in our cars and driving all the way over here because this is part of the process of renewing of the mind. You know, initially you get saved, you're filled with the Holy Ghost and fire baptized and uh, speaking in other tongues as a spirit give utterance and falling out and, and, and you still need to be transformed and transformed as a process. You see, oftentimes we don't commit to the process because you're looking for results very quickly. Uh, I know like, you know, like, like uh, when I'm working out and uh, just start working out, if the pounds would fall off immediately after one session you know every now and then I tease the guys and I say man look at me I've been to the gym just one time and I'm cutting up already <laughs> but but you have to commit yourself to the process even when the results aren't visible and oftentimes in our walk with God and, and the truth of the matter is you can transform your body a lot quicker than you can your mind because the mind has been formed by years of negative experiences and worldly inclinations and maxims and tenets. And at any given time in the world, whether you perceive it or you feel it, there are certain impulses and certain receptacles that you have that are receiving certain attitudes and dispositions. And so because I become a product of all of these things that are floating around and I'm absorbing them from childhood and making them a part of my mental and cerebral experience, I end up being something as a product of all the things that have come into me. Now, here comes Jesus. And what he says is, I want you to leap from where you are and from how you have been formed with all of your disappointments, with all of your lowered expectations, with all of your negative experiences, with all of the vestiges of those things that you have had to endure, and I want you to leap from there to where I want you to be. And I can only bless you when you change your thinking. Amen. Uh, it'll be there around you. It'll be at your hand's reach. And you will prolong the distance from slavery to ownership. I want to take it another way. What God wants me to do, and I haven't been able to master it completely yet, is to own my life. What he doesn't want me to do is to be slave to habits to situations and circumstance and think that that is living. You, 
follow where I am? You know, you know, you know, sometimes we become slaves to things, to our habits. And anything you can't say no to, you're not in control of it. Yeah, I wish I could talk about that, man. Yeah, I'd start crying and repenting and all that too at all the same time. Anytime you can't say no to a thing, it's got you. You don't have it. And many times we brag about all the things we can do and how we have lived, but at the end of the day, we have not lived in abundance because we did not have control. Abundant life means I control my destiny. And in order to control my destiny, I have to come from slavery to ownership. And, uh, and I'm talking not about owning things. I'm talking about owning myself. I wish I could talk about that. Uh, because at the end of the day, Nothing around me can ever give me peace. I have to internalize peace, have an unambiguous existence, and not let things drive me. My situation was made for me. I was not made for my situation. God gave me dominance over my space not giving my space dominance over me which means my space cannot dictate how I feel how I walk or how I rejoice or how I act towards God God has to dictate it I receive it control it and am responsible to put things in their right place and if it's any other way then I'm not in control and so now, I can't be transformed if I am conformed. Because whatever is controlling me dictates how I operate. All right? Now, with that in mind, we have to move to another level. And today, I wanted to take on the woman with the issue of blood because I sat over there and I heard so many different renditions and then it came to mind, came to mind, that in order for anybody to break into where God wants them to be, they have to break more than simply worldly controls and generational propensities and proclivities because we are now the product not just of 58 years of mess but I've taken on my father's junk and my father's father's junk and my father's father's junk I was talking to a young man today in Alabama trying to set up. He wanted me to come a certain time. I couldn't go, so I'm trying to deal with that. And when he got on the phone, his father's dead, his brother's dead. I said, now, if I didn't know better, I would think that I was talking to his father. Which means that something in his vocals were genetically tied to his dad. And if you didn't know better, know his nanny was dead, I'd say, oh my God, he sounded exactly like him. But now he is a product of his father, and his father is a product of his father, and a product, and a product, and a product. And so the stronghold is not just 58 years old. The stronghold is generational. And when you're going to break a generational stronghold that's been embedded in you since generations before you, you've got to have some power from the outside. You cannot be in the world and not of the world unless you have another stimuli. You've got to be getting strength from somewhere else because you cannot change if you don't change your source. Uh, I wish I could make this clear. I'm, I'm struggling with this over here. 
you can't keep going into the same place and expect to be different. And one of the things that keeps us from making this move is the fear of the unknown and the inability to remove the comfort zone. And sometimes people say with people uh, and, and don't want to be there. You know, a whole, whole lot of folks there folks don't want to be there. And wouldn't leave because they know the trouble they got. Uh, you, you know what kind of mess you in. And yeah, and, and since I have navigated my way through the old mess, I might not be equipped for the new mess. You see what I'm saying? Because again now, you are the victim of lowering your expectation. So faith now has to overcome all that. Now, I'm talking about world, you, and me. And what we have to overcome in order to make that quantum leap and move to the next level. I go to Mark chapter 5. I'm going to approach it this way. Uh, I'm going to approach it this way. And I thought I'd do it differently tonight, but uh, uh, I'm comfortable with it. I, I don't know about no new nothing. I'm just, <laughs> comfortable. Now, you know the story of the woman with the issue of blood. And we've heard it many times, and I've preach it in many different ways uh, but I want you to companion Mark chapter 5 verse 25 with Leviticus 15 and we'll go to 19 and now we don't uh, I, as I said I'm not Paula White so I'm going to handle this as carefully as I can she just come out with it but she, she just do it down I'm going to handle this just as carefully as I can over here in Leviticus. Now, uh, when you deal with Leviticus, now we have law. And we have the presentation of, uh, of law. It's, uh, it's got to be before Deuteronomy. Uh, numbers. Because uh, Numbers. Uh, uh, Exodus, Leviticus. All right, here we go. Was it 19? What is the 19? 15. 15, verse 19. And it says, if a woman have an issue, and her issue in her flesh be blood, she shall be put apart seven days, and whoever toucheth her shall be unclean until the evening. And everything that she lieth upon in her separation shall be unclean. I know this now. In her separation shall be unclean. Everything also that she sitteth upon shall be unclean. And whosoever toucheth her bed shall wash his clothes, bathe himself in water, and be unclean until the even. And whosoever toucheth anything that she sat upon shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean until the even. And if it be on her bed or on anything whereon she sitteth, when she toucheth it, he shall be unclean until the even. And if a man lie with her at all, and her flowers be upon him, he shall be unclean seven days. And all the bed whereon he lieth shall be unclean. If a woman have an issue of blood many days out of the time of a separation, or if it run beyond the time of a separation, all the days of the issue of uncleanness shall be. As the days of a separation, she shall be unclean. Now, it's one thing if I need to be transformed by the renewing of my mind from my gener generational proclivities, from my imbibing of the world's maxims, philosophies, tenets, concepts, if I have to be transformed from the vestiges of my associations and my experiences that left scars. 
and the scar. It shouldn't have pain. But it does remind us that we were wounded. And many times we have to be delivered even from the memory of having been wounded. Because most of us associate a wound with somebody. Particularly if it's psychological and some of us have some physical. Uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And deliverance has to come from that. I have to be transformed by the renewing of my mind from a place of bitterness to a place of forgiveness and that's not easy particularly if you have a disposition for certain things and you already have an inclination a proclivity maybe a predilection for certain things and to be transformed to the place where you can even control let alone not want it. Because I suggest to you that there is a transformation that brings you to a place where you don't want it. But there's also a transformation that don't quite get to the place where you don't want it. But you can control it. I'll talk to some real people here now. Amen. I can't go too far. They got a line somewhere. Am I doing all right? I'm, I'm within the parameters of, uh, and I won't run like I did last week so they can keep up with me. <laughs> Notice, if you will, there is a transformation that has already begun in your life because there were some things that were so much a part of you that you just couldn't walk away easy. See, many times we brag about the stuff that really didn't have a hold of us anyway. I thank and praise the Lord. I've been delivered. I thank and praise the Lord. He set me free. I thank and praise the Lord. He let me from stuff that wasn't bothering you anyway. Uh, years ago, years ago, and I'm, I'm going to take you to the next level in a minute, but years ago, there's a bishop in, uh, uh, he's dead now. Both of them are dead. You can talk about people after they die. <laughs> they can't hear it. They can't get it back. Can't expect. <laughs> and he was a prolific preacher, went the whole world over. And you know how preachers do. He comes to the church, he's preaching, and he's leaving testimonies. You know, and he, and This testimony this night was, you know, as a sister got, I was away on the road and somebody got saved. And, and when I came back, I had a knock on my door. He opened the door and it was the sister who got saved. That He didn't know she got saved, but she came to his house to say she got saved. <laughs> and he said, well, praise the Lord. Thank God you're saved. Bless God. And God's got more for you. And I'll see you. He was about to close the door and she put her foot in it. And she said, I have something else to say to you. And that is, I want you. And of course, you know how we do in this thing. Oh, loose your hole. He was preaching in Columbus, Ohio. The late great Carl F. Smith. And he left that testimony. And Carl F. Smith said to him, the bishop, he said, I heard your testimony and I thank God that you had the strength and that God delivered you and brought you out of that. And I heard your testimony. And the way you talked about it and expressed it. He said, but there is going to be a woman that you won't say anything about. A few years later, things went awry and he had to start 
another church because what happened to him broke up the first church. And he still went on to be one of the greatest prolific preachers the world has ever heard and seen. The point I'm making is it's so easy to get over who wants you. But your struggle is always with who you want. Oh, everybody got a whole lot of strength when it comes to what they don't want. When you consider then the intensity that comes with transformation, you understand that even transformation is a process. Because some things in my life, unless a miracle takes place, I will never be transformed to the place where I don't want it. I ain't like you. I'm, I'm, you, you know, I, 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 I'm not trying. It's some stuff I'm going to have to control. And if God can just transform me to the place where I can control it, I will have the victory. I'll shout about that. Amen. I'll shout about the fact that I just barely made it through, but I made it through. I'll shout about the fact that, Lord, I was there looking and almost touched, but I, but I didn't touch. I'll shout about that. I'll shout about, Lord, I looked at it, I cried because I couldn't get I just cried. I want to talk to some real people, man. I'm tired. So what I have to bear in terms of making the quantum leap from where I am generationally proclivity tendencies being born in sin shaped in iniquity having been dipped triple dipped double dipped in all of the things that are binding habits and now I have to make this leap into that place where God wants me but now I got another problem not only do I have to make a leap in my mind from the world and its maxims and tenets and from my own proclivities and tendencies and wants and desires that are not like God. I found where religion becomes a place that helps to keep me from making the leap. Now we, now we, what is wrong in the text or what's going on in the text is that this woman with this issue of blood has to deal with some rules because it's the Levitical law that says she has to be separated from her family. Can't nobody sit even where she sat without having to wash themselves in some instances and being unclean until the even. It would seem to me that if anybody needed somebody, it would be somebody who was in a situation that is now what I define as abnormal. Because the law was literally written for a normal situation with separation on a psychical manner. But how do we deal with the situation when it becomes abnormal? The rule wasn't written for somebody who was going to have an issue for 13 years. I wonder if you're with me here. 
I told you the story before I tell you again. There's a young lady in here that came to church one Sunday. She was a little low and a little high, her dress that is. It was a little low and, and a little high. Had she sat beside somebody who was spiritual, she would have felt some compassion even in her high low state but she sat beside somebody who was religious and the religiosity of who she sat beside superseded her person because the person was more concerned about their rules than about the individual herself. Okay, can I take it further? Can I take it further? What they didn't know, this religious person, was that what she had on on Sunday was more clothes than she had on since Friday because had you seen her Friday night she was stripping if you saw her Saturday night she was stripping but somebody told her that there is a place you can go where somebody will deal with you without judgment uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. And so she rushes over here, stops by to pick up whatever she could, and comes into the place and runs into somebody who puts how they feel you should dress above who you are. And so now God is bringing her here to change her from the inside out. That's spiritual. But religious folk want to change you from the outside in. not only got to break through from the world to Jesus faith sometimes has to break through from the church to Jesus because church folk will bind you with rules in changing situations this rule was made for something normal but this woman is dealing with something abnormal so church please tell me do you have the power to deal not only with the normal but do you have the power to deal with the abnormal because you need supernatural power to deal with the abnormal and you can't do it just being religious Some of us came to the Lord crazy. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And it may seem to you as if we haven't pulled it all in yet. But you met me after the process began. 
and you still can't handle me after the process began when you met me I was crazy but I was already three years into being decrazed so if you can't handle me after three years of being decrazed I wonder what you'd do with me if you saw me when I first arrived has fixed it so the religious the law this is the law to get to Jesus she's got to ignore Leviticus All right. <laughs> oh, oh, here's what I can do. <laughs> to get to Jesus, she got to break the rules. And the church should always be open to the individual who will protest your rules in order to get to Jesus. Right. Most of us, most of us, most of them. My, my father, you know, my father is, in, uh, you know, he's gone to be with the Lord, but uh, I still remember him every day. And I got a little thing. I'm going to play it over here one time, little thing that we did, that I did at the funeral. I'm going to play it just one day when I'm really feeling down. <laughs> I'm going to play it so y'all can feel down with me. <laughs> the Bible said weep when one weeps and rejoice when one rejoices. But I, you have experienced the transformation that your parents have towards you and your children. The difference between their approach to the grandchildren and how they treated you. It's like it's two different people. Uh, my father just walked up and just gave the kids, the grandkids, money. Just, oh, here's some. I said, Dad, they don't understand money. That boy is four, three, two, and just, oh, here, here, here. Oh, oh, just put it aside for him, put it aside. Now, when I need his money, <laughs> Danny, can I have five dollars? You got to have Randy do this for you. Can, Danny, can I have five dollars? Where's it coming from? Daddy, can I have ten dollars? Where's it coming from? Daddy, can I have fifty dollars? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Where is it coming from? <laughs> And yet he give it to the kids. It seems to me that older members or people who have matriculated in church for years lose memory of where they are coming from. And they create what we call a tradition because of how they process things during their entrance into the kingdom and for some reason they want everybody to be validated by the proximity they have to their experience and if someone articulates operates outside of what they regard as the norm 
Because the norm has become their experience. And so to break through to Jesus, you got to break the rules. Let me go further. The leper comes to Jesus and says, If thou wilt, thou canst make me whole. But he shouldn't have been in the public either. And he should be walking around hollering unclean. So the rules have separated who? The church from the people who need it the most. Because we form our little cliques. And it seems as if oftentimes we send out applications. And if you don't fill my application out right, you can't get up in my click. Do I have some time? This is the criteria for walking with Jesus is to walk within the parameter of my rules. And since we since we're there, Jesus says to his disciples, "In enter ye not into the way of the Gentiles." Now we have Matthew twenty-five. No, that can't be twenty-five. It's got to be fifteen. Uh, find out fifty and verse twenty-five, something like that. No, it could it be ten? Uh, go to ten. Go to ten. No, no, jump out. We go to Matthew for a minute. Hold on to Mark. Put your finger on Mark. Now go to Matthew for a minute. I got some glasses somewhere. And go, go, Matthew 10. And, and uh, Matthew 10. I'm, I'm, I got to make it even uh, more intense. Uh, somebody, uh, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. 10 and 5. All right. Now, Jesus says here, yeah, so I can see. I don't know why. I, I need to attach him to my faith. Uh, Go not into the way of the Gentiles and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not. Not even the Samaritans now because Samaritans are part Jew. -ish. And he said don't even go there. But go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Well that's what, that's what he told them. That's what he told them. Now over here, let me see, it can't be 25. It's got to be 15. I don't know what my problem is. 15, okay. Uh, Reverend, this, this Bible here. And verse 21 of 15. Now remember in 5 what he told them. And in 21, then Jesus went thence and departed in the, into the coast of Tyre and Sodom. All right. He has now ventured over into the same territory he told his disciples not to go. See church folk don't even shift its methods their methods when things are shifting around them. and for some reason now Jesus tiptoed over into Tyre and Sodom and it's something about faith when there's desperate need I think Malone was talking, I mean, the bishop, the bishop, the bishop was talking about the difference between just wanting to and needing to. Paul Tillich says that there is no revelation until there is ultimate concern. 
you should read uh, Paul Tillich. Uh, uh, ultimate concern is I have to have this. I can't lose this. This is not something I can take or leave. There is no indifference here. I got to have this. And when faith, and you know what faith is really? Prayer bringing need to God. So when I come in here, I'm coming in here desperate for a move of God. I got to have it. And he done tiptoed into my neighborhood. Now I argue many times and then people give me pet answers, you know, quick answers, quick fix answers, uh, you know, and, and stop my the machinations of my brain from trying to figure out the depth of really what's going on. How did she know it was Jesus? Because she's in her own homeland and there's great separation between those people. And yet still faith somehow identified that this is Jesus. And I may not get this chance ever again in my life. So now Jesus, as son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter's grievously vexed with a devil. Now she's as uncouth as the territory. She has no polish. She never been to the temple. She don't understand the fine ways of talking to the master. Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter's grievously vexed with the devil. I need somebody who can go to hell and release my child. What are you doing over there, Jesus? You told us into the ways of the Gentile, enter ye not. So now here is the master who gave the rule. Caught in a situation where he is somewhere, he told them not to go, and they with him. And one thing you know, you know, you know, you know how, how people do tell you what not to do. And then when you ain't watching, tipped on over. They done tipped right on over there. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Jesus didn't hide to go over there. He went over there with them. And the woman start hollering at Jesus. And here's what happens. He answers her. Not a word. But you're used to faith. There is no other text anywhere. Where he ignored faith. But here now he's got some rules. Because God sent him. To the lost sheep the tribe of Israel but faith is screaming at him from a horizontal viewpoint and he's trying to wrestle out what his mission is you see faith has got to holler until it shakes the church from whatever it's doing and pays attention amen you ain't got to, you got to have enough faith to make the church shift its program you got to believe God until whatever the mission was that they set up in the boardroom is no longer applicable because it's not meeting the need you have and you got to holler to 
until somebody discovers I have a need I might come in here not looking like the rest of y'all look but I have a need I might come in here and not know how to talk like you talk but I have a need I might come in here with my old ways but I have a need and if you ain't got the power to help me in my need take your sign down Not only do you have to get over your proclivities, your tendencies, your generation, influence, generational influences, you gotta get over the church. All right. Because in many instances, the church, in its institutionalization, has administered and manage the power right out the door. All right. We done regulated everything. No, I saw, I saw, no, 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 I saw an astounding piece of spirituality and power. And, and I'm sitting there shaking my head because, and I'm really glad because God revealed something to me. I ain't never had nobody walk up in here on no Sunday talk about they coming on Monday. In Los Angeles, California, Hollywood, where people got a whole lot of stuff to do and many distances to ride. But if you want to see the hand of God, you got to step out of your program. Because as long as you hold on to your program where we don't have church on Monday nights and I ain't going on Monday nights, you ain't desperate enough. If you desperate enough, I'll have it. The interaction is, is interesting now because just Jesus is the problem now. All right. I was in uh, Hampton and I told him, I said, Jesus was the problem in that text. And I preached 8,000 preachers. You could hear a rat licking ice up in there. <laughs> Quiet as a mausoleum. <laughs> All right, let's see. Let's see if let's see if we can prove uh, that to some extent. You know, we got the professor over there. Uh, uh, is she still here? Uh, so, so you know, I got to be careful. You know, just can't just just can't be throwing out random statements and uh, you know just talking. Uh, let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Now I had it in his Bible. Now I'm trying to find it in mine. See, I think I got it over here. So, yes. He answered her not a word. And then here come the church folk. They, the Bible didn't say they asked him. They besought. It's a little stronger word. Even though it's old English. They besought him. Which means they begun to pray that she go away. I don't know if you've ever been to a church where, where you just felt like you were a spectacle. You know, sometimes it goes like this. Somebody invites you to church, didn't, didn't tell you what to dress on you, didn't tell you how to look. And you walked up in there like you look. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's like, like, like wearing shorts to an inaugural ball. It goes like, man, you could have told me how to look, man. You could have told me I needed this. You could have told me. It's because now you're a spectacle completely. And they besought him to send her away because she crieth after us. Wrong, man. Didn't nobody come to see you? See, even sometimes, even sometimes preachers get beside themselves and make icons out of themselves. And let me tell you something about being an icon in a, in, in a business such as this. People don't forgive God. talk to me make a god out of yourself and then make a mistake you fallible man and close the door to your own restoration you made a god out of yourself and, oh we're gonna deal with some of that that's gonna be interesting this whole uh, next four weeks it's gonna be real interesting the lord help us very interesting we didn't come here for you we just thought that somehow in all of what you do we could have a meeting with jesus uh, the Greeks came one time. The Greeks came to the disciples and said, we will see, we would see Jesus. Uh, let's get it straight right from the beginning. We're here to see Jesus. But in order to see Jesus, you got to have enough faith not to have your feelings hurt by normal church folk when you got an abnormal situation. All right, so now, He's got two requests before him. One is, my daughter's grievous is vexed with the devil. Two, send her away. He's got two requests. And he opens his mouth again. He answered and said, but notice now, there is no object. So the question now is, who is he talking to? He answered and said. He goes like this, but I'm not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. This is my mission. This is what I'm expected to do. She hollered again. Lord, help me. Help me. The most dramatic help me I've ever seen in my life. I don't know uh, 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 cinema, uh, cinematography, uh, uh, c cinematographic experience. Help me. You ever seen the old version of The Fly? <laughs> help me help me help me there is absolutely no way that you can have the sensitivity of Jesus and not wrestle with your mission and somebody hollering help me because Jesus is too compassionate to be religious he answered and said but again it doesn't say to whom he's speaking it is not meet 
to take the children's bread and to cast it to dogs. Jesus called a woman a dog. That's a whole other message now. Uh, give somebody a high five and say, don't trip and you'll get blessed. You got to have faith that doesn't trip. Because if you trip easy, you're going to trip over church folk and never get your transformation. You got to have faith that won't trip when it looks like you're praying and all God is sending you is insults. Uh, that's what folk ain't tripping to. Said truth, Lord. I knew who you were when I hollered at you. I know you were Jewish when I asked you. And I know you ain't got nothing to do with us. I already knew that. But what I need is so intense that I'm calling you out of whoever you are to help me to be delivered out of this situation. If I'm going to make the quantum leap, I got to be able to face any kind of insult and still hold my ground. Hey, God, God, yeah. Reach down and grab it up. Tell somebody, hold your ground. He's getting ready to bless you. Hold your ground. He's over there thinking about it. Hold your ground. He's over there working it out in his own mind. He gonna work it out. He gonna work it out. He gonna work out the mission. He gonna find out. Let me hold my mission and bless this woman because she ain't gonna let me go till she gets blessed. Oh, woman. Uh, now he answered and said unto her, Notice now, now we got an object. Now he's talking to her now. When he gets ready to talk to you, it don't matter who's mad. He'll bless you and the whole church be mad. He'll bring you out and bring you up and let everybody be mad. Because your faith withstood the test of everybody's disposition towards you. Uh, I feel the Holy Ghost in here. You got to hold your ground because when he says now, daughter, your faith, oh woman, great is thy faith. He said now be it unto you, even as you ask. You got it. I worked it out now you got it now go home and I promise you when you get there and look at the time that I was talking to you she is healed about the same time go your way is already taken care of because you can press your way through religion uh, I got a few minutes I'm quick. Religious folk. No parameters. I got narrow. I'm, I'm a gregarious person. Oftentimes to my chagrin. Because sometimes I don't know who to gather around me. I like people. I like all kinds of people. I like crazy people. Like argumentative people. <laughs> I like to have fun. I like people. I, I sat, in the, I, I was telling him, I sat uh, in the middle of the road on Market Street in Philadelphia between this fella sleeping. Free uh, uh, in Ma on Market Street in Philadelphia, and that was where he slept every night till the police came and moved him. He was homeless, and I had just left some big meeting. And as I was heading somewhere, I saw him there, and I went over to give him some money and sat down with him. 
the car's going boom, boom, boom. And I'm saying, man, I have never seen such peace in my life that he could sleep there. I'm talking in the center divide, concrete center divide, Market Street, Philadelphia. Cars going this way, they're going that way. And now I lay me down to sleep. <laughs> I pray the Lord. And the, the interchange was so wonderful because immediately now I, I want to probe to see how could he have ever gotten to the place you know, because now I'm tossed between whether life was that significant to him or not. You know, that he could, you know. So we had a wonderful conversation. And, 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 and I've had the privilege of talking to presidents. I've had the privilege of talking to people who had nothing. And it made no difference to me. I enjoyed the interchange now. Now notice now, I am just a man. A flawed man at that. And I tell people all the time. They say, Bishop, why are you dressed down all the time and uh, running around incognito? I say, I'm too flawed to be flashing. <laughs> uh, ain't no sense of me walking up here with no whole lot of colors on. <laughs> Car with a license, with, with, my, with a, a specialized license tag. Bishop Jones is here. Somebody might borrow my car. And I'm so <laughs> I used to tell my sons all the time, I said, now you got my car. And we in Longview, Texas. We got 70, they got 10,000 black people here. Now, you can't go anywhere with my car. Anyway. Jesus' parameters are so wide. It includes the whole world. Which means you're going to come up to see Jesus. And somebody is going to be around Jesus you don't want to deal with. Like your ex-husband at the 8 o'clock service. So now you come to the 11. I didn't know he'd be up in here. That ain't John Doe over there, is it? I can't come back to this service. The proof of the magnanimity of Jesus in his ability to draw is that you aren't the only one he's interested in. And you can't fix your rules so that the church that administrates the things of Christ becomes a barrier instead of an access to the people you don't quite get along with. I, I wish I'm talking to you. you. You know when we are growing in God is when God keeps putting us with people who force us to become more like he is. Get rid of your little cliquish rules, your little petty rules, and let's open our hearts up so that we can bless people of all kinds, all ages, all attitudes, all dispositions, all proclivities. So we can transform. Now jump now from that to the woman with the issue of blood. And here she is now in her abnormal situation blocked by the law by no stretch of the imagination should she be in the public because in order now for her to go into the public she gonna break the law now, did I say anything about the man sick with the palsy his four friends brought him and tore up the man's house. You got to break something, bud, to get your breakthrough. You got to break something to get your breakthrough. 
Amen. If you ain't ready to break something, you ain't going to get no breakthrough. If you ain't got ready to break up with some friends, you ain't going to get no breakthrough. If you ain't got ready to break up with the church, break up with the preacher, break up with the deacons, break up. You're going to have to break up with whoever's in your way to get to Jesus, to get your blessing. That's how it works. Shake somebody's hand like you're going to shake it off and say, that's how it works. You don't know how much breaking I had to do to get my breakthrough. You don't know how much breaking up I had to do to get a breakthrough. What do you do? When the blessing won't come to you and you're desperate. What do you do when you read the law and the law separates you? Now in a normal situation, the law is applicable and sensible. But we ain't dealing with normal now. We don't going to have normal up in here. I don't brought my abnormal self up in here. Because ain't nobody normal going to come see me when I'm abnormal. But even abnormal people need blessings. Uh-huh, uh-huh. I want to talk to you. Even the crazier, the craziest need blessings. You know, walked up in the chain and fucking sit down. No man, yeah. look over there. Look over there. Look over there. <laughs> you see that over there? You see that over there? What's she doing up in here? <laughs> what in the world is he doing up in here? Look at his hair. Look at his hair. Look at his hair. Do you see that hair over there? folk need to be saved and when the rules don't fit the abnormal I got to get out of my house and go look for my blessing and who don't like it got to deal with it but I'm getting ready to touch him who touched me who touched me now the whole question carries with it now greater significance because she knows he's the master and the rule says nobody can even sit where she sat without cleaning themselves up and now she has the unmitigated gall and audacity to touch him with her sickness Can, can I tell it's like I feel it? It's one thing if you allowed me to decide whether I wanted to minister to you or not with what you got. But you got the nerve to try to sneak up on a touch. Like you don't know I'm the master, I'm Jesus. And you can't sneak up on no touch here. So who touched me? Because I feel virtue leaving me. Whoever touched me was so messed up that it drew out of me some stuff that I haven't felt left me in a long time. I got news for somebody in here tonight. I don't care how crazy you think you are. Reach up and grab him and don't see will he not bless you and move you to another level. And who don't like it? That's your business. I'm getting ready to touch him with my crazy self. Touch him with my abnormal self. Touch him with my weak self. Touch him with my backslidden self. I'm getting ready to touch him. Who 
Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost in here. I feel deliverance up in this house. I feel God moving on somebody in here. Don't write yourself off because what you've been going through, other folk don't understand. Who oh, your faith got to break through that. God bless you tonight. Heaven smile on you tonight. Who touched me? See, see, the church has got to react supernaturally to the abnormal touch. Amen. Because all y'all normal on this pew. I mean, I Oh, no, I, 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 that don't mean I ain't coming. I'm coming up here with all you normal folks with my crazy self, and I won't get a blessing. And when he get through with me, I'm going to be more normal than you. Who <laughs> touch? Take it. If you're in this house anywhere, and you want to be saved, I don't care what your problem is. You just have to reach for Jesus. In the midst of all of the convoluted church pronouncements and religious announcements, you have to reach for Jesus. And as I close, I'm close with an observation that tells me that the paradigm is shifting. And a shifting paradigm, uh, Bishop Jakes puts it like this, uh, you know, he <laughs> tells me. He says, when two people ride on a motorcycle and you're going to turn, you need both people leaning with you. He says, you never have problems while you're going straight. But it's when there's a shift. When things shift, you find out who's with you. Amen. Because I'm leaning this way and you sitting straight. Just wrap your hands around my stomach and just lean with me. We have heard more health, wealth, and prosperity preaching in the last 15 years. Every kind of way. The wicked is stored up for the righteous. And that context needs to be looked at. Look at it properly. Because the greatest shift of wealth in the history of the world is taking place now. And it's going from Christian to Islamic countries. Seven hundred billion dollars a year and now we got another group we add money to we owe the Hindus the Buddhists and Confucian I mean Confucius is <laughs> Confucius we owe them three trillion dollars so not only is our money going to Islamic countries it's now going to China And America is the predominant Christian country. But they have made material things in a Christian presentation so significant that the wealth that was stored up for the righteous is now being mailed back over somewhere. Health, wealth, and prosperity. But the jobs decline. Health, wealth, and prosperity. But one and a half million Americans losing their homes. Somebody lied to us. Well, a terminological inexactitude. <laughs> we can call it a lie, but. The 
It was just a, a doctrine that obviously had no prophetic foundation. Because now we should be basking after 15 years. I'm still looking for my Rolls Royce. I ain't got it yet. I, somebody laid hands on me sometimes and said, Bishop Jones, I see you in a Rolls Royce. Rolls Royce. Somebody's going to give you a Rolls Royce. I ain't seen it yet. Amen. And the way things are going now, I don't know. <clears throat> that person to change their mind now. We have to get back to fundamental truth. And we have to get back to the revival of Monday night, to the revival of last week, to where church people thank God to be healed, Thank God to have peace of mind. Where we love one another. Where we uphold and lift up one another. And we see people falling into sin and into disrepair. We pick them up and turn them back around. Set them back in the right place. We have to move back to that. Because the circumstance is moving us. And you can't keep going straight when the road turn everybody to your feet in the name of Jesus again if you're in this building we offer Jesus we offer Jesus we offer Jesus pass me not oh gentle say is that the right key you all all right Do not pass me by. Come on, young man, young lady. Come on, God's calling you. Blessed Savior. Give God praise. Somebody's coming. Come on. Come on. Hear my. Hear my. church home come on come on the lord is calling blessed say